Welcome into the Paul Kuharski podcast. Anxious to talk to you today as part of the 440 Network brought to you by Jaspers about the Titans mystery offense that's going to be unveiled on Sunday in New Orleans. The backup quarterbacks and how life changes for them as the regular season begins. How the Titans have been great with money heading into the 2023 season and much more. So let's take it away. The unveiling of the Titans' new offense is one of the biggest things we've been waiting for heading into this year. Tim Kelly, the new offensive coordinator, there was some disappointment when Mike Vrabel did not go outside of his coaching staff to name a new offensive coordinator after he got rid of Todd uh, Todd Downing, who was really bad um, as the offensive coordinator after Arthur Smith. But... Tim Kelly gets a clean slate and very quickly from the first time we talked to offensive players after they came in and got what Tim Kelly was going to be serving them. They made it clear that Kelly's takeover was not some slight tinkering with Downing's offense uh, and with what he had in place. While Mike Vrabel said, you know, it's not all broken The Kelly and Charles London offense sure sounded like a major overhaul in the way that Ryan Tannehill quickly said the whole system is pretty much different. We've got ideas about what we're going to see, right? For sure, we're going to see different formations and plays out of the same personnel groupings, which creates less predictability, at least on one level. There were a lot of times we saw certain people come onto the field last year where we knew exactly what was going to happen. If Cody Hollister was a single wide receiver in a one wide receiver formation, that was a Derek Henry Henry run with very few exceptions. It was a rest play for the wide receivers who were going to actually have a chance to catch passes. And that's just, just one example. Uh, tempo was a huge key word early. This team's going to be able to go fast um, on on demand. I think we'll see it more often as a change-up. We'll see it more often when the Titans want to trap a defense in certain personnel that they feel they can take advantage of with who they have on the field. And that'll be a nice nice thing that that, uh, a lot of people were calling for more often last year. Why don't they speed things up? when they're looking, you know, flat, when when they need to get things going. Um, and that's certainly something that's more in their tool bag than it was last year, though they don't like to acknowledge that uh, what they weren't doing last year, it's clear that it's something they could be doing more this year. Talk to Derek Henry about uh, – you know, what we're going to see with the new offense starting Sunday in New Orleans. I'm just excited about the offense in general, us to get right out the, us to get out there and um, put the plays together that we've been practicing and repping um, throughout the offseason and through training camp and let us see all, see it all come together and playmakers make plays. To what degree do you think people will be surprised by, by what we see as compared to what we've seen in, in the past from the offense? I guess we got to wait and see. <laughs> Talk to you all, Rock. Well, we've been waiting. We've been waiting. It's uh, it's it's exciting that we're going to get to the seeing time. Talk to Tim Kelly along the same lines. He downplayed it a little bit into being just kind of, uh, you know, the start of, of any season. I think it's bigger than that. Yeah, I think uh, every time we're getting ready to go play the first game of the season, you kind of have that feeling. Um you know, you spend a lot of time in the off season watching a lot of tape, uh, evaluating the players, evaluating the scheme, and uh, excited to go out and, and be able to kind of show uh, what we've been working towards over your, however many past months it's been. I think it can be more fun. I think it can be more creative, more inventive, more responsive, all of those things, and still be very Derek Henry-based. And as long as it's Henry-based, it's going to be predictable in a sense, right? There's no getting away from a high percentage of runs on first down, on second and manageable. Vrabel has preached efficient passing. Well, efficient passing tends to be supplementary passing. It's not passing to set up the run, but passing that comes off the run 
in play action and beyond. I think those remain principles of the Titans offense. I think that's part of what he was saying it was not broken. Um, and, and I think as long as Derrick Henry is a foundational piece of this off, offense, which he certainly is this year, there's only so much that they they can change, right? If you're expecting an unpredictable offense that's going to be, you know, a high-flying first-down passing offense, well, maybe once in a while as a change-up. But Derrick Henry needs 18 or 20 carries generally, and I don't know why the Titans would go far away from that. I mean, DeAndre Hopkins and Traylon Burks and Chig Aconquo are better options in the passing game. But Ryan Tannehill is still the quarterback. He's still got the limitations that he had before, and he's still his best playing off of Derrick Henry. I don't know why they would go off of that. Here's Nick Westbrook Akine, who is the um, third senior most player, third senior most player on offense after Derrick Henry and Ryan Tannehill. About the Titans taking the lid off the box that the offense has been in. Yeah, you know, it's it's a lot of hard work we put in this offseason. Uh, so excited to just be able to go out there and play the game we love and show all the work that we put in and, and see the fruits of that labor. Do you think people are going to be surprised a little bit by what you look like, this version of the Titans offense? They might. You know, I... I'm not going to be surprised. I, I've been here. I've been seeing everything that we've been put in. So I'm just excited to do that. You know, if people like it, they like it. I hope they do. I hope for their sake, I hope for your sake, it's different, different enough to produce more than 17.5 points a game and win. Uh, there's as much hope, uh, different enough that there's as much hope coming out of week one as there is going into week one. Let's put it that way. Money matters. The Tennessee Titans, um, look, have not gotten enough credit, I don't think, for what they did salary cap-wise in this offseason. So let's let's run it down. The Titans had to shave $23.7 million to get under the cap in March. They cut Taylor Lewan, Bud Dupree, Ben Jones, Zach Cunningham, Robert Woods, and Randy Bullock. Bullock. Are we missing any of those guys? You know, you'd love a healthy Lawan, but a healthy Lawan was a thing of the past. Um, a healthy Dupree was a pretty good player, but uh, he, he was overpriced, and I think you'd take the Arden key, certainly at his price, in exchange for Dupree. Ben Jones, you know, was a sentimental attachment for sure. But his age and health concerns uh, and price made him somebody that uh, it was necessary for them to move on from. I don't hear anybody lamenting uh, any of those guys not being around. No one's pining for any of them. By my estimate, and this is rough math, but, you know, certainly accurate in, in general terms. They added 27 new contracts, totaling a little over $38 million, plus extended Jeffrey Simmons. Later, they trimmed $3 million with Kevin Byard, and they just saved $8 million restructuring Harold Landry. That's the uh, cap move that needed to be made when it went from uh, – yeah, a, a lot of teams made a cap move when it goes from uh, your top 51 to your top to, to your full roster to your 53 counting against the cap. So Spotrack has them at uh, $10.48 million of cap room, which is uh, a nice number as a contingency cushion and, and to have some carryover if you don't need to spend a lot of money during the season. They did not touch Ryan Tannehill's $36.6 million cap number. They did not touch Derrick Henry's $16.4 million cap number. Both of those guys, they are free and clear of after this season. So they can see how things play out and they can go from there. That is pretty remarkable to have the second highest cap number in the NFL. 
Ryan Tannehill's $36.6 million cap number is second only to Patrick Mahomes, 39.7. And they didn't touch it in the offseason where they needed to find a bunch of salary cap room. They didn't touch Tannehill's 36.6. They didn't touch Henry's 16.4. And to summarize again, all rough math here, they shed about $24 million to get under the cap in March. They gained 16.6 because the cap went up. They added 27 contracts worth around $38 million, and they created roughly $11 million of cap space with two other contract revisions. That is a job well done by Rand Carthon, the new GM, and Vin Marino, the longtime cap guy. Now, there are questions about how these low to mid-level price guys perform, and they brought in a lot of them. 2023 cap numbers under $3 million. Arden Key, Kendall Vildor, Andre Dillard, Aziz Alshair, Daniel Brunskill, Sean Murphy Bunting, Luke Gifford, Trevon Wesco, Chris Moore, and on down the list into uh, cheaper draft picks and, and undrafted rookies. There are five of those. They are counting on a lot of guys that got at very reasonable prices. But you're not looking at many people that came in during this cap major cap revision and saying that many of them have too big a number on them, right? Now, next year, they're going to be in good cap shape from the start. They could be in terrific cap shape um, if they move on from, from Tannehill and if they're paying only um, quarterbacks on rookie contracts um, and they'll be able to go out and overpay. They'll have to go out and overpay some premier free agents but um, they did an unbelievable job with a tough cap situation, getting where they needed to be and restocking the roster. Are all these guys going to hit? I think there's too much hope right now that like they're going to hit on, on all of these guys. That'd be, you know, a batting average. Nobody bats a thousand. Um, so we'll see where they miss. But, you know, if they have a decent batting average, between the cap struggles and the holes on the roster, we know the depth is a problem, but they they've set themselves up to be in pretty good shape and they deserve to be commended for that. I'm brought to you by Jasper's, which is a great restaurant and bar on West end Avenue, not far from downtown. I suggest you go there and you go there soon. Menus jam packed with great dishes. You can get anything you want to drink. Um, and, you can park there for free, which is a giant in and around downtown in Nashville, Tennessee, as we now know it. You're not parking anywhere for free. Um, so you pull up, you park for free. You you can order some food with your, your, your family or your date or your spouse. You can go play some games and have a good time. Those are also for free. Pop a shot, air hockey, ski ball. Um so you, you got those options. You can go there for a business lunch. You can pull up a, a stool to the bar like I do when I go most of the time and uh, listen to a podcast, do some reading. It's a very versatile place. Jasper's is versatile the way Mike Rabel wants his Titans players to be versatile. I think that is a perfect comparison. Menu's versatile also. So head there, have a meal. And uh, I'm assure you, once you do, it will be on your list of places that you go on a regular basis. I appreciate their support. Let's start quarterback development because life changed this week for Malik Willis and for Will Levis. In training camp, really changed last week. In training camp, uh, look, they're not getting Ryan Tannehill reps, but they're getting a decent amount of work as the second guy and as the third guy. There are reps to be had. There are not reps to be had in regular season work. The reps that they're having are vast majority of them are scout team reps. 
I don't know if they're going to split up the scout team reps or if the second guy is going to have the scout team reps and the third team guy is going to watch the scout team reps. Um, but, you know, and Levis didn't even have all of those uh, preseason reps. He didn't play in two of the games once he strained the, strained the quad in Minnesota during the joint practices. Um, and uh, maybe still limited some by that. So the Titans make a good case uh, and, and put a rosy outlook on what the two can get out of what they've got now during the regular season. Prime developmental time for quarterbacks is over. Ryan Tannehill said there was a quarterback room conversation about this, about, quote, how we're getting ready to go into preparing to win games and not so much development end quote. It's more challenging, he said, but definitely crucial. Here's Charles London, the quarterback's coach, with uh, with two answers about the plan for continuing to work with these guys while the focus is on Tannehill and the Titans' offensive game plan to uh, get him ready to win Sunday's game each week. Yeah, you know how most of the stuff works is the starter gets the majority of the reps during practice during the week, and then uh, you know the the guys that are the backup in the backup spots they're getting the scout team reps. They're throwing in between special teams. They're doing work after practice like we just did. So, um, you know, we have a plan, and you know the guys know the plan, and we've talked through how how the reps are going to be split. And obviously, they have put in work on their own, and then it's extra film time. So uh, we've got a plan for each of them, and uh, we like where it's going. Opportunity for development and growth slow down during the season as compared to, to training camp when there's a lot, a lot. No, I, I don't think so. And I, and I told both those guys, I said, look, you know, your job actually got harder now because both you guys have to know the game plan like you're the starter without getting the reps, but yet be able to go out there and operate whoever the opponent's offense is. So it's actually gotten harder for them. And uh, they've both done a good job of embracing it. Have you split scout team this week? Yeah, everybody's getting reps. So it's, it's been good for everybody. So, uh, you know, we're out there. They're getting throws um, during special teams. So it's been, it's been a good rotation for everybody. Like I said, a lot of it's done during special teams. It's done after okay. practice. It's done in the film room. Um, so, you know, make time. You know, some, meet, some of them sometimes all meet together, and then sometimes it's separate. Maybe Will just comes in. Maybe Malik just comes in. Maybe they address something specific that each of those guys have. But they understand the task. They understand what, what their goal is now. But they also got to be a great caddy to Ryan, all right, yeah. because, you know, he can't see everything. So they have to help him with different aspects of things. And, you know, they may see something on the field that he doesn't see. So they have to be a great caddy for him, but then go out there and be able to operate the opponent's offense. So the players are the plays, you know. They may call it one thing, we may call it another, and you just have to impress upon those guys. These are your game reps. When you're out here on the show team, like that's your game rep. All right, we have that play. You run it like our, it's our play. You read like it's our play, and that's how they get prepared to play. That's all well framed by Charles London, and I like the way he puts it. And the Titans are going to do the best they can, giving Willis and Levis those practice squad, quote unquote, game reps that they translate into meaningful Titan stuff to work with them during special teams after practices, maybe on Fridays, you heard some details there of, of the plan, but there's only so much that they can do. If Ryan Tannehill's playing and they certainly hope he's playing, you know, every meaningful snap of all 18 weeks, then the two young quarterbacks are studying and studying and studying, but there's no test. They can't put what they're learning up against a live rush and against real coverage. They just can't. And that's why developing a quarterback behind the scenes who doesn't play is a rather slow process in the NFL. Now, you'd rather be able to do it than not do it, particularly with a guy like Willis who comes from a small school and needs time to expand his field of vision. And I mean that in multiple ways. That's great for, for Levis too. I mean, you know, he could have wound up in a situation where he was jumped into the lineup sooner or, uh, you know, would be behind a lesser quarterback than Tannehill or on a worse team that would need quarterback help sooner. But, but this is the way it is. There's no game for them to play to see if what they're learning is better. Unless Tannehill's hurt or unless the Titans are getting blown out or blowing somebody out. And even in those situations, then you're not really running everything. Um, and it's just the way things are. And Tannehill is and should be the priority in everything they're doing. 
and um, you know monitoring how they're doing. We're not going to know much about it. The press doesn't see any of practice that is scout team related because that scout team related stuff is game prep. What's open to the press is the uh, individual period, the stretch and the individual period. So we'll see them throw a little bit with um, with Tannehill doing drills under London, under Tim Kelly. And um, we'll see them interact a little bit with wide receivers. Um, but beyond that, and there won't be a whole lot. And so we'll be left to check in with them to have conversations with Willis and Levis about their progress and to get reports from, from Vrabel and um, from Tim Kelly and from Charles London about what, uh, what progress they're making. And odds are they don't lend a lot of specifics on areas that they're working on. It'd be great. Uh, and maybe they'll give us nuggets here and there about progress that they've made or areas that they're working on. But mostly the blinds get pulled down now. And, you know, again, barring a Tannehill injury or some mop-up work, we're not going to know a lot. And we may not know a lot again if things go reasonably well for the Titans. We may not know a lot again until the spring when we see these guys on the field at OTA. So as big of a story as it's been – and by the way, Malik Willis has to be the backup uh, for the Saints game. Levis can flip that at some point, but with him having been as limited as he was, having missed two preseason games, there was no way for him to overtake Willis with his play, no matter how well he did in the classroom during that time and everything in terms of game experience. You know, <clears throat> I think if, if, Tannehill gets hurt right now. The Titans would have to bring in Willis and they would be conservative, not as conservative as they were last year because he could do more, but still ball security is a big issue with him in terms of the interceptions that he threw in the preseason in terms of his tendency to, uh, to fumble the ball. They'd want to protect things. They would count on the run game and the defense and more from Malik Willis than they were able to get from him last year when he started before they went and got Josh Dobbs. It would be a better scenario, but still not an ideal scenario, obviously. And the room for Levis to take over from him to take that second spot, um, you know, that's all going to happen behind the scenes. We're not going to see it coming. And there'll just be a Sunday, perhaps, when when uh, inactives are announced that uh, which quarterback is technically inactive changes. That inactive quarterback, of course, is eligible to play if the other two quarterbacks cannot play in a new rule this year. And so all three quarterbacks will be dressed on a Sunday under the parameters of that rule. Um I need you to subscribe to paulkuharski.com. If you're not a member, $5.99 a month. It's a steal at that rate. If you're watching me on YouTube, please subscribe and like. I would appreciate that. Whatever uh, podcast platform you're listening on, please do whatever they allow you to do in terms of liking and rating. I appreciate your support there. If you're at the site, Mike Herndon's got a piece this week about the four biggest things he's watching for and some textured uh, analysis of what he's expecting in those four categories. Uh, Friday morning, Blake Bettingfield's preview of the game with some specifics about the, his uh, matchups that he finds favorable to the Titans matchups. He doesn't find favorable to the Titans. That'll be up this week. I've had a look at practice time for veterans when they're not on special teams and what they do with that. There was an episode of PK TV, um, and there'll be one of those from Caesars Superdome on Sunday evening, uh, not long after uh, Titans Saints wraps up and I return from the locker room getting reaction. Um, and I've got a piece coming or, or piece, uh, there was another piece out on whether the team is fixed or not piece coming. If this is the swan song for Ryan Tannehill and or Derek Henry and what will 
tell us that. All for the pro low price of $5.99 a month. You spend that on a coffee or a drink. Three other notes before we get going here. Um, Karis Jackson is going to be the return man for the Titans, at least until um, – at least until we see Kyle Phillips. Hopefully for them, he does well enough to, to maintain the job and to maintain a roster spot. A lot of rookies have a uh, get it moment during their first camp when they kind of figure out how they need to approach things. And Kiaris uh, told reporters this week, he figured out he had to talk less and listen more. Mike Vrabel had this interesting tidbit on the uh, receiver slash return. At some point in time, Kears decided to, to be coached and to work each day and improve and, and change some you know, behavior and, and learn multiple positions and then also um, be consistent catching the football and taking advantage of his opportunities. What did you have to say to him during his initial reluctance maybe to Get him out of that mode. Well, I mean, it's just, I don't, it's not negative. I don't want to mean it as negative. It's just that, you know, guys that are conscientious, that, that show up, um, want to always do the right thing and, and understand that we understand that there's going to be mistakes and maybe how they, they coached it at Georgia or how he learned it or how he thought it maybe wasn't in line with what we, you know, were looking for. So again, it's just about not making excuses and just having accountability and saying, yep, that has to be better or I, I see it or whatever it may be. And you know, he, he did a nice job. One guy I'm really curious about on this team and how he's going to get himself more snaps is Tier Tart. Um, Vrabel and Terrell Williams have both said, one thing he needs to do to get himself more more snaps is to be in better condition. And so I had a chance to check in with Terrell Williams on, on how Tart has done in that department. Um, something that Vrabel said had to come from practice, couldn't come from, from training beyond practice in, in the weight room or, or on the field running. Williams started with how he feels about where Tart is Right now, he's for for. Sorry, he's for for this day. He's exactly where we need him to be going into this week one football game. I like where he is. I like his attitude. Um, his work ethic's been great. Um, you know, I, I like where he is right now. Mike talked a lot about that conditioning not coming from running after practice or or in the trainers room, but from snaps at practice. So you can. I remember I had a guy that played linebacker and we moved him down to pass rush we moved him down for pass rush and he they ran the ball a couple of times and the guy was worn out that you can't get on the field running hundreds and two hundreds and forties and all that you can't get d line conditioning from that it, you're leaning up against guys and the, the amount of energy that it takes you can only get it from doing those movements so He's done a good job in training camp, and his attitude's been phenomenal, and I, I like where he is right now. Finally, Ty J. Spears. Everybody is excited about the running back, and we've been talking about what he does with the ball in his hands, whether he gets it in a handoff or he, he gets it as a, as a pass catcher. But a moment that Mike Vrabel talked about this week that caught everybody's eye had to do with something that he did when he was not a guy with the ball in his hands. Well, I think it, there was a time in Minnesota where during practice, Tajay stepped up and you know, met a linebacker right in the hole uh, just from the different looks that they gave us. And you know, I pointed it out to the team and every, you know, the defensive guys were like, oh, you kind of hear him talking. And that was the reaction I kind of expected. And when I showed the tape or the play to the to the team, and knowing that the offensive players would have seen it or had seen it, uh, but the defensive players didn't. And I said, that's the way that a young running back earns the respect of his teammates, is that they are able to protect the guy with the ball and not just do what they do with the ball. You know, we, we've seen examples of him you know, making plays with the football in his hand, but it's how you play 
uh, without the football that I think really guys appreciate or certainly I appreciate. So there you have it. That's uh, this week's edition of the Paul Kuharski podcast. My thanks to you for joining me. My uh, thanks to Jaspers for sponsoring me and my advice to you as always, don't block the box and be sure to lock the locks. I'll talk to you Sunday from the Superdome after the game. Uh, PKTV next week for members and also uh, 8 to 9 Wednesday morning on Robbie and Rexwood on 102.5 The Game, a new weekly hour with them. Don't miss any of it. Be sure you're a member. Take care.